Welcome back to Seeker Strength and welcome back to Seeker Psychology. No matter how you train or what sport you play, I bet you can choose a movement, something you've practiced hundreds of times, and make a strong prediction of outcome prior to the movement ever being finished. If you do snatches in your training, as you pull the bar from the floor and extend upwards, you'll be able to predict the future and tell if you're about to make it or miss it as the bear passes your hips or around that point. Now, most of us will call this motor memory or we'll attribute it to the feeling of the bear during the pull or during the extension, but in fact, it is so much more complex than this. So let's look at some real examples. Take your mind back for a moment to 2019, pre-COVID times, the world is great. We're at a sunny Wimbledon, the world's best have fought for a place in the Wimbledon finals, and Novak Djokovic is placed against Roger Federer in the match to be named both world number one and Wimbledon champion. So we see here Djokovic serves to Federer's forehand in a six or so shot rally. Federer is kept at the back of the court until he finally crosses over for a forehand. The forehand shot is straight down the line, about a meter or so inside the tram line. But Federer doesn't even recoil his racket to return. From the moment Djokovic hit, Federer knew the shot would be out of bounds. Now, this is a long distance, and we're talking about centimetres marking that ball out of bounds. Just minutes later, it happens again, but on the other side of the court for the other player. This isn't luck, and it's certainly not laziness. Now, Djokovic went on to win the match, but how did he have the ability to apparently predict where the shot was going? Was this from watching thousands of shots like it? Or had he heard the sound of an overzealous racket strike? Or was it just intuition? It turns out that elite performers have enhanced abilities to predict motor outcomes. In a really interesting paper from Allegoretti in 2008, we saw that elite basketball players can accurately predict the outcome of a free throw without ever seeing the ball hit the basket. Interestingly, they don't even have to see the flight of the ball. Now, when we make all the internal predictions, each and every time we execute, observe, or even imagine an action, the accuracy of the predictions or the estimates do seem to correlate strongly with the strength of the motor schema present in the individual. Obviously, it makes sense. More experienced, more skilled practitioners can predict these movements more effectively. So it makes a lot of sense that Djokovic would be able to predict the ball's trajectory, which seems almost impossible for us as naive observers. In this video, we'll look further into the areas of action anticipation and motor resonance, further with a view to demystifying motor cognition from the aspect of motor observation and mental imagery. We'll narrow in on these predictive and preemptive neural activation sequences and discuss the application of these kinds of models and frameworks in the applied setting, so how you can actually apply them in your own training. When we look at motor cognition and motor learning, we have a barrage of interesting cases to look at. Athletes are seen to be training motor patterns, both physically and mentally. We see Formula One drivers sitting in their chairs, far from the extremes of the track, mentally training themselves to race. Or we see bobsled competitors standing at the top of the slope, eyes closed and swaying from side to side. These images are a mainstay in the sporting arena and the nomenclature of mental rehearsal or mental practice are now popping up in every commentary box across the globe. But what's happening here? Are they just rope learning each bend and manoeuvre, like a child learning their multiplication tables? No. These rehearsals and run-throughs are activating the precise locations in the brain which are associated with the movements being rehearsed. When we look at the neural images from these scans, we can see it's an identical activation pattern as if you were performing that Formula 1 track or that bobsleigh track or if you were performing the snatch or the clean and jerk you were just about to do. Earlier we heard about basketball players being able to accurately predict whether a shot was made or not without ever seeing the flight of the ball. This finding would make sense, but the magnitude of the difference in their predictive abilities across elite and novices are also vast and should be paid attention to. Also, only the experienced players had time-specific motor activation in the brain. 
So although novice people might be able to have the same level of activation in the same areas of the brain of throwing a basketball, in terms of the predictive outcomes, the time-associated or time-specific motor activation is absolutely vital. So what's going on here? How do these discrepancies exist between skilled and unskilled humans? Well, at the moment, it's thought that the presence of a motor schema or a pre-learned motor pattern in the brain may be the key to these predictive activations. So if this is to be true, and these predictive abilities are or are not due to high levels of training which an athlete goes through, then how could a test for general populations be carried out to find if certain people are just better at mental imagery or better at motor learning? And from there, how could you bring this into your own training and make yourself learn physical skills or your sport itself faster and more effectively? Well, initially when these studies were done, a common movement to all humans was found, and that's the upright walking gait. So very defining stride of Homo erectus is a movement pattern with which general populations are extremely familiar. But would this pattern be picked up even if the form didn't appear to be human? So if you saw a person walking down a track, then the person disappeared behind a curtain, you would think that the normal brain would pick up and predict the movement pattern, the gait, the speed of the individual, and then pick up the image just as the person came out from behind the curtain with quite a high degree of accuracy. And this is true. But what happens if the image wasn't of a person? What about if it was a series of point markers, not really descript, but which would appoint to knees, hips, shoulders, etc.? Then we would expect the same result, and the results are the same. The human brain showed activation in brain activity as they walked, as they watched these dots with the human walking. But interestingly, the behind the curtain section also continued. So these predictive outcomes were identical, even though it wasn't clearly a human, and we were just looking at certain points moving on a screen. The real interesting thing here, though, is that the activation in those centers of the brain, the parietal cortex and the premotor cortex, are significantly amplified during the obscured sections. So these areas of our brain, when we're imagining a movement rather than directly observing it, are greatly enhanced. Now, just to follow up with this, when the point markers were moving in a somewhat random configuration, so just a group of point markers moving down a track or a screen that we're watching them move down a track, there is no predictive outcomes. We cannot make good predictive outcomes, both in terms of the actual pattern and how they're moving, but also in terms of the time predictive element of it. So let's take another example from another study, and this is done back in 1964. So you're looking at a screen, the screen is displaying a video of a hand and a block. The block is a dull gray color. Then we see the block turn to green. The hand reaches forward, grabs the green block. The block turns back to gray. The hand returns to its original position. Now we see the block turning red. The hand does not reach forward and the block does not turn gray. What we're looking at here is a coined phrase known as the readiness potential. What we're basically looking to see is if I change the color of that block, so if I'm now watching that video, having watched my hand reach forward and grab it when it was green, what happens in those areas of the brain when the block turns green or red again? And what we see is, looking at that premotor cortex and parietal cortex again, is when the block turns green, those areas of the brain light up. We have a readiness potential ready to go in our brain. Those motor neurons are active. Our brain is already kicking off that sequence that we need to move forward, even though our hand has never moved. We've never even done the movement itself, but we've just watched another human hand doing it on the screen previously. Now, obviously, the inverse of this is true as well. When the block turns red on the video, then we don't have any activation in those areas of the brain. Okay, so where does this leave us in terms of a model or a framework, even if it's a theoretical model? Well, it brings us back to the brain and to the specific neural mass known as motor neurons. You might have seen videos on the Seeker Strength channel talking about the previously. So these neurons sit as pairs to the neurons in our brain which control voluntary muscle contraction and are present across the entire premotor cortex, the parietal cortex, and the motor cortex. 
These neurons activate when an individual observes, imagines, or performs an action. They allow us as humans to learn purely through observation. And the advantage, of course, is that we're given the ability to develop motor schema or this motor memory without having ever performed a physical task. Our minds are now brought back to the Formula One drivers and the bobsled teams and the weightlifters imagining the movements. Eyes closed, going through mental runs through the track or the movement, these athletes are building and enhancing an actual motor schema during these imagery tasks and not necessarily just learning the patterns they're going to go through. As humans, we're literally equipped with a system to download information and run through motor patterns without ever having performed the movements previously. It's literally like we're learning in the matrix, downloading this information or skill for ourselves. So what does this mean for us as athletes or coaches or sports psychs who are structuring training schedules? Well, there's a model for learning known as the Ripple Method, which states that all learning starts with a want and a need to learn, which then moves on to doing, making sense, feedback, verbalizing, and assessing. So it seems that beyond the initial wanting or needing to learn, each step of this process could be getting some more enhancement from motor neuron and action observation. Not doing the movement ever, of course, uh, may have a lesser degree of activation, a far lesser degree of physiological adaptation and activation, but it has a level of activation of motor neurons in the relevant brain regions, which is not insignificant. It would appear from this that action observation could be integral to every step of our learning as an athlete or our coaching of athletes. Even newer coaching models and theories such as the challenge point framework where a Goldilocks effect is seen between task difficulty and performance outcome uh, to a point of optimal learning, we could see how higher levels of task difficulty may lead to decreases in overall action observation or in fact action observation of incorrect motor patterns if the task is far, far too difficult. Let's take example of the weightlifter again. If we're being challenged by a weight which causes excessive technical breakdown, the entire movement is never going to be executed, observed, or felt by the athlete, causing an actual breakdown in that motor pattern learning. And even if we are completing the full movement, we're completing the full movement in a non-ideal motor schema. So moving forward, we should be recommended to prioritize showing and instructing highly proficient movements and allowing sufficient feedback to the athletes so as to allow movements to be mastered. This is a direct step of moving away from running athletes into the ground, which should really be left behind and replaced with a sensible and informed coaching strategy and programming setup that encompasses the scientific knowledge which we now hold within the community. A newer and probably more innovative approach to this will be a combined model in all of your training sessions. If you are trying to hone a skill, get better at whatever movement you are doing, and I know sometimes we say, oh, certain sports are higher skill or lower skill than others, so I don't need to concentrate on as as much. A great example of this is Owen's recent 300 kilo back squat. He talks about the extreme importance of technique all the way through the training cycle and it's not just about these levels of physiological adaptation but that it's physiological adaptation combined with a very concerted effort to get better technique all the time. Now the final thing I'll say is a Nelson paper brought up the fact that youth athletes are going to be more effective at this and that certainly is deemed to be true. So we see younger athletes having higher neural plasticity which could afford them a higher yield of motor learning but I think it's important for all of us at every level of sport to be focusing on this all the time to get the best possible skill learning outcomes. Thanks very much for watching. If you are an SNC athlete and you want a really condensed, highly effective training camp, we have a training camp coming up at the end of May. It's being held in Portugal at Titan Fitness Algarve, where we've had our training camps previously. This is three days, two sessions per day, going across power and speed work, strength training, long-term programming and adaptation strategies, also 
all you're going to need for your sports psych and your long-term planning. This is a great way to set yourself up for the next year or two years or three years of training with this condensed coursework over the course of three days. If you're interested, shoot us an email. It's seekastrength at gmail.com and we'll provide you with some more information.